and we gonna play Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> so you think you think he was Diddy's concubine? Absolutely. The n- gave me something I smoked. It was called the Snoop Doggy Dog. They told me only take four hits. I took more than four hits. I was naked and dancing in front of his window. But you better believe. I will have my say. Gene Deal has been on a roll lately, and this time he is exposing the dark truth about what happened to Fonsworth Bentley, one of Diddy's alleged concubines. You got a lot of people, man, that's wondering why Fonsworth Bentley, you know, why he hasn't came out and defended Diddy. You know, they was real cool at one point, you know, so. Well, I was there when Fonsworth Bentley got his actual name. How they came up with the name and everything. We were sitting in front of the uh, apartment building on 74th and Park Avenue. It was me, him, Tony DeNaro. Puff was upstairs. They was trying to figure out, he had became Puff, one of Puff's personal assistants. You understand? To make sure all sh- Puff sh- is there when we get ready to go. Everything that was supposed to be in order. That was Farnsworth Bentley job. When Puff, has to go to restaurants and place like that. You know, uh, he made sure everything was straight with that. You know what I'm saying? He had another assistant too. Uh, But Farnsworth Bentley was his personal assistant, put out his clothes, told him what he should wear, all that, like a stylist and personal assistant all together, you know? So we was in front of the house and um, this dude, Tony De Niro, he played guitar in that uh, Bad Boy for Life. The black dude, not the white guy. The black dude who played the guitar, that's Tony De Niro. I think he might be from California or something. So Tony De Niro was like, yo, we got to think of a name for you, man. And if you're going to be his personal assistant and um, slash butler slash umbrella carrier, whatever you gonna do, you understand? We gotta think of a name for you. We are gonna try to make you like Bentley or either uh, uh, Fonsworth or either Bentley. You gotta be, you know, you gotta have that kind of persona. You gotta dress all the time, be neat and the whole nine yards. And then the dude, Derek, was playing with him like, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I know how to do that. I could be over the top. You know, he was acting like that. He was always right there, but not like at nighttime when we was at doing things, he was, he wasn't, he wasn't around, bro. He was only there when the cameras was there and shit like that. You know, I don't know, you know, I don't know how much he was he could do. I don't, I don't know if he would say anything. Cause he probably signed the ND, a non-disclosure, and he don't want to say anything against Puff anyway because Puff got shit on him. And I ain't talking about no sexual shit, you, or none of that shit. The nigga was stealing, bro. <laughs> yo, bro, the nigga's a, yo, he got, he, I don't want to put that on sticky fingers. That nick, that nick right there, bro, don't lay nothing down around him. You hear me? Don't lay nothing down around dude right there. Dog, Jennifer Lopez had these boots, they cost $5,000. I was like, what kind of fucking boots cost $5,000? Now you gotta realize, this is like in 2000, early 2000s. These boots cost $5,000. And because she was going to be out of out of the country or something like that, she didn't have them come to her house down in the village because she would have never got it because they'd be stealing her stuff down there at her apartment. So she had them come to Puff House. She wanted these so bad. She was mad. We, you know, they was they looked through everything trying to find Jennifer because Puff had like a, you know, Puff people used to just give them shit and send them shit from everywhere. So he had this room, this mail room in his house with numbers just that he never even opened. But I don't know how Farnsworth Bentley found that shit. But we went over there to his house and we found a lot of Jennifer shit. 
and everybody else's shit that belonged to Puff. I guess, I guess Puff had too much stuff in the room and he was just keeping them for it. And hey, you seen this with your own eyes? That's crazy, man. My own eyes, bro. We went to his apartment. He don't even seem like that type of dude, yo, but damn. Security. Security also we went over there, man. They had good dude shit, bro. And that's why Puff had stopped messing with him. And then he goes get a show. Puff ain't say nothing. He went and got a show of how to be a teaching thugs how to be the gentleman. I hope the first thing he talked to him was that, don't steal. <laughs> this makes for an interesting comparison to the widely accepted narrative. The widely accepted narrative is that Derek Watkins adopted the moniker Fonsworth Bentley in the early 2000s, a reference to a character from the 1975 film, Let's Do It Again. He got the nickname while working as a full-time butler for billionaire producer Sean Diddy Combs also known as Puff Daddy at the time. Diddy's desire for a fresh start arose from his legal problems, which included gun possession and bribery allegations following a nightclub incident in 1999. This resulted in a change not just for him, but also for Bentley, who became a key member of Diddy's entourage, assisting him in navigating the world of refinement and style. Bentley's career quickly took off after that. Despite beginning as Diddy's umbrella holder, he swiftly rose to prominence in television, music, and even writing. While he moved away from the umbrella, his influence on mainstream culture persisted, cementing his legacy as a hip-hop icon for years to come. Moving on to Diddy's latest activities, it appears that we're getting a closer look at his antics, particularly through Cassie's lawsuit. This highlights facets of Diddy's persona that may have gone ignored for years. Fans have long speculated about Fonsworth Bentley's absence from the business, noting that he was making great progress not only as Diddy's sidekick and stylist, but also as a multi-dimensional talent in his own right. Bentley's visibility skyrocketed in the early 2000s as he accompanied Diddy everywhere, including big musical appearances with OutKast and Kanye West. His interest went beyond music. He also worked on Obama's 2008 campaign. This relationship with Diddy originally benefited Bentley, particularly during Diddy's shift from Puff Daddy to P. Diddy. Diddy attempted to disassociate himself from previous controversies, including a legendary nightclub shooting in the 1990s. Bentley's influence helped Diddy polish his image, resulting in the adoption of the name Fonsworth Bentley, which Diddy bestowed to him. Now, one curious thing about Fonsworth Bentley is how he seemingly vanished from the industry. Despite working with some big names and even featuring in one of the most iconic campaign videos, he just up and moved to Atlanta people were left wondering what went down and why he chose to leave his promising career behind. All Diddy had to say about it was that it was time for Fonsworth to move on. So Fonsworth ended up in Atlanta, got hitched, and now has a couple of kids. But hold up, the drama doesn't stop there. Jaguar claimed that Fonsworth got married and had kids because of some serious trauma he went through with Diddy. Allegedly, he was involved in some questionable activities with Diddy, if you catch my drift. Jaguar Wright certainly doesn't hold back when talking about their real relationship. Let me let me let me ask you this. What what do you think Diddy and Fonsworth Bentley's real relationship was? Concubine. Master. Ooh. Period. Everybody know Bentley. Everybody know. I think the thing that everybody is having a hard time grasping is how that whole thing could have probably went down. But the thing is, is it was how fast he disappeared. Yes. Now he, he lived I, in Atlanta. He's married. He has two sons. He's living. Yeah. He's living his life. I mean, but how many? Listen, y'all. If you've ever lived in Atlanta, you know the majority. Uh, the ma okay, the majority yeah. of them are bisexual and gay men. Yeah. They just and give up the life to be married and gave their life to God, and they your pastor. And download culture is still very, very, very heavy in the black community um, in Atlanta. It's funny because Atlanta is like a gay mecca. You would think that there would be no need for download culture, but download culture is thriving in Atlanta still. And it's weird because you can find whatever you want in Atlanta, any kind of relationship, poly, the yeah. 40s, 
whatever yeah. you're into, you can find somebody there that's into it. It yeah. ain't it really. You may meet somebody and a, a lady say, "Yeah, these are my two husbands." Yeah. And we gonna play Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> So you think you think he was Diddy's concubine? Absolutely. He was too complicit and he was too compliant. And he just disappeared. He disappeared faster than Mace did. I just I don't understand why people don't ask why. People, oh yeah, yeah, he gone. Oh, okay. Nobody bothered to ask why. Why doesn't anybody ever want to know why? Now, all of a sudden, people start opening up their mouth talking. And then everybody, <gasps> really? Yeah. <gasps> really? Because I could have swore to God, me and Storm Monroe sat here three years ago and told you all this. Oh, he's a Morehouse graduate. OK. Interesting. It's all very interesting. The saddest part of all this is how it's affecting the people around him. It seems like Diddy can't come to terms with his true self, so he's out here causing turmoil in his relationships. Jean even claims that Cassie left out some crucial details in her lawsuit because Diddy allegedly made her. Apparently, he was into some pretty extreme stuff. How you feel about Cassie outlining everything that Diddy did to her, he's settling so quick. And I read all 35 pages of the court documents and I believe he did this. Well, as arrogant as he is, if he didn't do it, I guarantee you he wouldn't have paid. The simple fact that he paid so quick and it was wrapped up so fast, in my opinion, only lets me know that he knows. Let me stop the faucet of information here. Yes. I not only think that everything in those 35 pages is true, I think some shit was probably redacted. Yeah, they, they didn't put everything. I don't think they put everything. They didn't put every, but if they would have went to trial, you know, they would have oh, had to go Lord. discovery. Man. Oh, Lord. Give her the, listen to me. This, this did it. This did it. Hold on, hold on. Hold on, man. Wait a minute, I gotta kick. It's Diddy right now on the phone. How fast can we liquidate? <laughs> you had a boat too. The <sighs> Bentley? Get rid of it. Yeah, no, 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 I need it in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Heinrich! <laughs> Gutenberg! <laughs> Tactical! <laughs> Calling bankers. <laughs> Cause you called it. You said he's a sex trafficker and, and, and sure as sure as you were right. That's literally what she accused him of. Having yeah. all these freak offs, uh, yeah. um, forcing her to have the male prostitutes. How do you feel about him making her search for prostitutes who were dark skinned with big black? That's literally what he made her search for. I mean, that's what he into. into BBCs. I thought it was also interesting that he wanted her to keep her nails white because he liked how it looked when it wrapped around the BBC. I said, you can't make this up. I mean, they got glow in the dark nail polish that accomplishes the same goal. But it's, um, this, you know, I keep telling people that I've been polite. I really have. I've been polite. Um, Cause if I was to tell people exactly how grimy this gets, how easy it is to move girls around and traffic young women, which is why I thought it was so funny when they were trying to accuse me of trafficking Regina Gold. How did I traffic her? The girl asked for my help. I raised some money. I sent her the money. She bought her own ticket. She put herself on a bus and came across the country. I met her in Texas. I live in Texas. 
That's not trafficking. Like, by no means is that trafficking. And on top of that, bitch, 30 years fucking old. This ain't no Amber Alert shit we talking about. She was 30? Cause she's 30. Why she was trying to act like she was 19? Oh, oh. She 30, she grown, she grown, grown. I just, you know, listen to me. As much as I did enjoy some of the time, cause she's very talented in so many ways. Um, and she is smart. She just looted. it. Mm. She's schizo. You know, when you go, you're sitting there, she make a little fort out of the comforters. And she be sitting on the floor, go alive under the comforters. In little fort. I, <laughs> okay. I, so she just, her, her, her elevator don't go to the top. No, I think the elevator goes up and down fine. I think we're not sure about who's going in and out of it. I think that's... Wow. Wow. The fact that Diddy made Fonsworth disappear may not be all that crazy, considering what he is alleged to have done with Kim Porter. But you seen what Albie Short said? Him insinuating that Diddy had something to do with him getting in the coma? Man, I don't... You know, I don't know if Diddy capable of doing that. If he capable of blowing people's cars up, if he capable of giving, uh, what's that guy named Machine Gun Kelly to have him butt naked in the window dancing? That's his own artist said that. I ain't making this stuff, bro. You ain't hear his artist say that? Machine Gun Kelly said, yo, the n gave me something I smoked. It was called the Snoop Doggy Dog. They told me only take four hits. I took more than four hits. I was naked and dancing in front of his window. <laughs> I was like, is he capable of doing that? Yo, I don't, anything is possible, man. But I would wonder how did he get that close to Al to give him anything? Or who did he give something to to get an Al to make that happen to him? You know what I mean? Because, you know, him and Al never been the best of friends. He had more think that he had adopted Quincy, and he never did. Al was never out of his son's life. I knew Al way back in Mount Vernon. He used to wear leather pants and 100 degrees. <laughs> I'm I knew him way back then, though, man. Al a good dude. A good dude. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? So if Al got something to say about that's happening to him and Puff has something to do with, trust and believe he going to have evidence to substantiate that Puff did that shit. Either he gave him something or sent something his way was dating Kim. You understand? That's his kid's mother. And they was cool. They was friends. Misa and Kim was cool. They was all in that Uptown family. Uptown record family. How you gonna date the mother of my... You my man, you cool. We all be around each other, and you dating the mother of my son. Alan never go try to date me, son. You know what I mean? Right, yeah, that ain't cool, man. But you can tell Al be sure he don't like Diddy, man. You can tell he got a disdain for Diddy. Now, Fonsworth may just make a return after it has been alleged that Diddy may be put on trial for the 1999 club shooting. Diddy has always managed to avoid responsibility for it, even despite one of the victims speaking out against him. According to this woman, she says that she's been telling this story consistently for years, but there's been a cover up. And if we've learned anything from the Cassie story and the recent allegations and other lawsuits, it seems as if Diddy has a pattern of threatening people and cover up. 
and she literally says that he had to end up paying her for that incident. Again, as always, these are allegations. I just want to play what she says for you because a lot of people are saying she's been saying the same story for a very long time. A lot of this has been covered up and this is why the public doesn't know about her story. Hey, how you doing? So, hmm, here today about this latest lawsuit with the P. Diddy, Puff Daddy, Puffy, Sean Puffy Combs, whatever you want to call them. Lawsuit that has come out involving the producer Little Rod. So basically his last two lawsuits or last two major lawsuits, um, the one with Cassie, she made mention that Puffy made her carry his guns into nightclubs and wherever they went. And he threatened her to make her feel like she had to do so. And of while there were lots of things of importance, that stood out to me, and I'm gonna tell you why. In this lawsuit with the producer Little Rod, they were both essayed by him and threatened and physically harmed. But in this lawsuit, he appears to be a very young producer to me. But he said something very specific. As a means of threatening him, Puffy said, that's why I shot up the club in New York back in 1999 and let Shine take the fall for it. Let me tell you why that's of utmost importance to me. Because I am the woman who he shot in the face in that 1999, December 27, 1999, Club New York shooting. The bullet, I got shot in my face with a nine millimeter, excuse me, nine millimeter hollow point bullet called a cop killer. I literally have told everyone and never changed what I said. I watched him. I got pow pow in the face. I watched him fire the gun. I've said it all this time. Even the surgeon who did my surgery to take out part of the bullet fragments that was aspirating into my lungs and try to remove as many bullet fragments as possible testified in the criminal trial that while they were putting me under, I was screaming, Puffy, pew, pew, me in the face. He testified in the criminal trial. It is in the record. They all knew he did it. Everybody knew he did it, but he paid off the club bouncer named Sharice and all these other people and the club owners with their video to hide the video. That's his MO. I told everybody that. This man almost took my life, has traumatized my life, has caused undue harm, irreparable damage to my life, lied his behind off. I've had all these youngins on the internet seeing me swearing that I'm making it up that he did it. And look what he did to Little Rod. He threatened him. Oh, you don't think I bust my gun? I shot up the club in Club New York and let Shine take the fall for it. I shot them people. Well, well, well. It only took 24, 24 whole years for it to come out. You see this tattoo? This commemorates me getting shot. It took 24 years for him to come out and say it. I've been saying it all along, but y'all pick and choose who y'all want to believe. Oh, baby, you ain't seen nothing yet. Not only did he pew, 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 pew me in the face, he also set off a course of harassment against me for the past 24 years. When I tell you the things I went through, there was a time in 2017 and 2018 where I got seven flats on my BMW, seven, the same tire, in a two year span, seven. You see this Rico charge that's about to come? This conspiring and pew peering up the club and ruining or attempting to ruin my life? As God is my witness, I will not stop until you suffer every single iota 
of punishment until I have every second of recompense that you took from me. For every tear that I had to cry or my children had to cry, I am going to get a million back from you. I will not stop until you pay the price for what you did to my life. And for all you people out there on the internet and in cyberspace and in the far reaches of my life or the perimeters or wherever, who always like, oh, she just saying that to get some hell. What you got to say now? What you got to say now? I had some youngins on the internet that ain't even old enough, that weren't even alive when it happened, arguing me down, cussing me out, calling me everything but a child of God. Go check Instagram. It's there. Passing my life. Passing me. Oh, you lying. He ain't do that to you. You just want clout. You just chasing clout. What is that to chase clout about? How is that clout chase worthy? It doesn't even make sense. Well, I guess you, it would make sense in this new generation, but you better believe I will have my say. In December 1999, there was quite the scene at Club New York in Manhattan involving Sean Diddy Combs, Jennifer Lopez, his bodyguard Anthony Wolf Jones, and the young rapper Jemel Shine Barrow. Things got heated, shots were fired, and three people ended up injured. After the chaos at the club, Combs, Lopez, and Jones decided to make a run for it, leading the police on a wild chase through the streets of New York City. Eventually, the cops caught up with them and found a stolen gun in their car. One of the victims, Natania Rubin, claims that it was Combs who pulled the trigger that night, and she's been vocal about it lately. Following the incident, Combs and Lopez were arrested and initially charged, but the charges against Lopez were dropped pretty quickly. As for Combs, Jones, and Barrow, they faced some serious charges related to gun possession. Prosecutors even claimed that Combs and Jones tried to bribe the car's driver to take the fall for the gun in exchange for some serious cash. After a lengthy trial, Combs and Jones were acquitted, but Barrow wasn't so lucky. He was found guilty of several charges, including criminal possession of a weapon and assault. However, he was cleared of attempted murder. Barrow ended up serving close to nine years for his offenses, even though no one was ever convicted for the actual shooting itself. After all is said and done, it is possible that Diddy may just watch the ghosts of his past come back and haunt him. That's all for the video, folks. Thanks for watching.